Cool. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event for the final revival of Opal and Nev with Donnie Walton and Naima Coster. Um, I am Laura. I'm the events coordinator for the Astoria Bookshop which is the bookshop hosting this magical event. If you did not know who we are because you know the author or you somehow found your way here through the internet, um, we are a general interest bookstore based in Astoria, Queens. Um, before we get to the fun stuff, I just have a few little housekeeping rules. Um, the first thing I want to go over is um, you will have the opportunity to ask questions with that little ask a question button down there. You can ask your own question or you can vote on other people's questions. So we don't get a bunch of repeat stuff. If you see something you really want answered, just press the arrow and it'll float up to the top. Um, other than that, please be respectful. Um, this is a safe space for people of all types and we are not uh, condoning any specific language that is harmful or offensive. Um, don't say anything you wouldn't want your mom or your boss to see. And other than that, um, you can buy the book, you can buy a signed copy, which we will have, um, Donnie will be stopping by the store on Saturday to sign copies. So we'll have those ready by next week. Um, but you can order a signed copy ahead of time and use the little notes uh, section if you want any sort of dedication. Um, you can all do that with the button down there that says get your signed copy here. It's pretty easy. It's magical. Um, I love the internet. Other than that, let's start introducing our guests. So first, we have the, uh, the guest of honor today. <laughs> um, Donnie Walton is a writer, editor, and author of the novel The Final Revival of Opal and Nev, a finalist for the Aspen Words Literary Prize, Longlisted for the Women's Fic Prize for Fiction and named one of the best books of 2021 by the Washington Post, NPR, Esquire, and former U.S. President Barack Obama, among others. No big deal. Just, <laughs> just casually amazing. <laughs> Her work explores identity, place, and the influence of pop culture. Formerly an editor at Essence and Entertainment Weekly, she has received fellowships in fiction from McDowell and Tin House and an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop. Her writing has appeared in Oxford American, Bon Appetit, NPR, Lit Hub, and Black Ballad. Born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, <laughs> Florida represent, she lives in Brooklyn with her husband. And Naima Coster, who is our, uh, our guest, our conversation guest today, um, is the author of two novels, What's Mine and Yours, an instant New York be Times bestseller, and her debut, Halsey Street which was a finalist for the 2018 Kirkus Prize for Fiction. Naima's stories and essays have appeared in Elle, Time, Quayle? Quayle. Quayle, okay. I want to make sure I'm saying that right. Um, the New York Times, The Cut, The Sunday Times, Catapult, and Elsewhere. In 2020, she received the National Books Foundation's 5 Under 35 honor. Naima has taught writing for over a decade in community settings, youth programs, and universities. She currently teaches in the low residency MFA program at Antioch University in LA. She occasionally writes the newsletter, Bloom How You Must, and she lives in Brooklyn with her family. Okay, I will leave you all to uh, listen to these amazing, impressive women speak about literature and this novel in particular. All right, I'll be back around 7.45. Thank you. Hi, Donnie. How are you? Naima, I'm so, I'm so excited to talk with you. I mean, gosh, when was that that we met last time? I can't remember. It was, it was like maybe it was July, something like July. Maybe July. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was that a sort of window between variants and yeah. Yeah. got to meet for the first time. And yeah. you're just such a, I'm so excited to be able to talk with you again. Thank you. Me too. I'm honored that you asked because as you know, I love the final revival of Opal and Nev. I love the beautiful paperback cover and I am just delighted that we have this book in the world. It meant so much to me when I read it last year. Um, I more than loved it. I admired it as a writer, as a woman of color who has long loved rock music as a reader 
it created a mythology and a history that I loved sinking into every time I opened the book. And when I finished it, I had this bittersweet experience of wishing that the novel were about real historical figures yeah. so that so that I could Google Opal and find old footage or pictures so I could listen to the songs and albums in the novel. Um, so that was sort of like the bitter part, but it was sweet too because the book was so satisfying and electric and powerful. And as soon as I finished it, I knew that I could look forward to rereading it. So it is just a marvel of a book. It's a technical marvel where I was just left in awe of your gifts um, and your mastery. It was moving and it was that rare book that is both fun and alive, but also deeply serious. Um, in its examination of race and gender and celebrity and music and allyship and history. So it's just so profound and wonderful. And I wanna thank you for it and congratulate you on the paperback and its mm -hmm. success and encourage people who are here for our conversation to get a copy of the final revival <laughs> of Opal and them. If you haven't yet, uh, I hope you heard that Donnie is signing copies at Astoria Bookshop and that you can get a dedication put into the book if you leave it in the notes section. So that's pretty special. Um, mm. And so I want to encourage and remind people to do that and to pick up this wonderful book um, for yourself and for the people in your life. Um, and so I, I would love to just start by having you, Donnie, tell us in your own words about this book and what it wow. is. First of all, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. My cheeks are hurting. I'm smiling so much. And I always feel like I'm so flattered, but I'm so also like weirdly just in awe and want to kind of hide under a rock because like writers like you that I've admired for so long and just like to hear you speak that way about it. It it really means a lot, um, especially what you said about being a woman of color into rock and roll, you know. Um, yeah. So uh, the final revival of Opal and Neb, you know, it's interesting, Naima, what you said about when you finish reading it, kind of having the wish that, yeah. that they existed in the world. And that's really how this book was born. It was my personal wish fulfillment through mm -hmm. the creation of Opal Jewel, who is sort of the star of the novel. So the novel, it's a fictional oral history. It's about Opal Jewell, who is a Black American woman born in Detroit, and Nev Charles, who is a white Englishman. And they sort of get together in the early 1970s and decide to kind of take a chance on each other, make rock and roll music together. Um, so the novel follows their rise and sort of a very iconic moment, a headline making moment that puts them on the map. And then they're kind of, you know, the way they fall apart following that moment. And then there's also um, a journalist in the year 2016 who's telling their story as they sort of decide whether they're going to reunite for a reunion tour. And in that process, you know, the journalist character's name is Sunny. She sort of is uncovering never before heard information and 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 one explosive secret that kind of threatens to blow everything up so you know it's a novel that takes place over the course of several years and there's new york there's paris there's birmingham alabama there's birmingham england and we kind of follow these two oddballs and the you know the wild people around them Yes. I mean, it's amazing how big this book is in terms of the time and the cast of characters. Um, and it was totally immersive. I was just in it in the most wonderful way. Um, so thank you for introducing us to it. And I want to ask a question about Sunny, this yeah. journalist who's putting yeah. together the oral history that is the novel. You know, I, I read the jacket copy before I got into the book. And then on the very first page, we learn that this journalist, Sunny, has a really personal connection to the story um, that her father played with Opal and Nev, um, yeah. that he was involved with Opal um, while her mother yeah. was 
was carrying Sunny. Messy, um, messy. Messy, messy. Um, and his his absence um, hangs over Sunny's life. And so, you know, when I discovered that, I thought I was already so excited about this book and I didn't <laughs> even know that the journalist was gonna have this messy connection to the material, this fraught relationship with Opal, who's both a hero, but also someone mm. who took something away from her and from her family. And so I'm curious whether you always imagined the journalist, Sunny, having this connection to the story of Opal and Nev or how she changed over the course yeah. of your writing the book. So I love this question um, because Sunny, did not exist as a character in this story mm. until very late in the process uh, of writing my first draft. So I had probably finished about two thirds of a full draft before she came into the picture. And what happened was, you know, I was just writing the straight oral histories. I was in the 1970s, just telling the story pretty, you know, traditionally moving straight through time. And I started workshopping those pieces in grad school. And my mm. classmates said, you know, this is really interesting. We like this, but we're dying to know who's on the other side of the recorder. Who is everybody mm. talking to? Who's absorbing all this information and how are they reacting? And I thought, oh, well, that's really interesting, right? And so I had maybe about in the oral histories, I had a little paragraph from a secondary character that was just gonna pop up on the page for one moment and then go away. But it was this woman who, you know, her father had had an affair with Opal and then out of guilt, after the father dies, um, Opal pays for her schooling, her college. And so it's always been very complicated for her because she's grateful to Opal, but also kind of, you know, bitter about it because of the issues it cost in her family. And I thought, hmm, there's something in that idea that I really love. Um, a character who is an icon, but also very flawed and sort of putting mm -hmm. that into relief. And so I decided to pull that character out. And I said, you know, what if she's the one putting together this story? And what if she has that stake in it? You know, she's trying to learn about her father at the same time that she is trying to keep this magazine that she works with afloat while she's also trying to uncover something new and different and get these people to talk to her in a way that they haven't talked to anybody else. And so there was so much richness to the character. And additionally, Sunny being born automatically added a new timeline and a different mm -hmm. timeline. And so, you know, I was looking at the characters now, not only as 20 somethings in New York City, but thinking about them in their 60s and sort of reflecting back and being able to show them in that kind of wiser hindsight. And so it really excited me. And I thought it added like a new richness and a new layer and so many different possibilities. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine the novel without Sunny and the way that she felt so intimate and close, like became a person who we could track through the whole novel with, in addition to all these other perspectives. And who also, you know, helped me think more about Opal and the ways that yeah. Opal is magnetic and legendary but also more unknowable than than sunny like has had to protect herself as a black woman in the spotlight in this particular musical world um opal was fascinating to me i loved her for what an icon she was i loved her for her messiness um and i love and she is She's the heart, the star of the novel and the heart. Um, and I was curious if you could talk to us about your influences in writing Opal, how you came to imagine her. Um, she is just wonderful. And she's a literary character who I will always remember. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the idea, the. The idea for the novel sparked with the idea for Opal. Opal was everything for me to, to this book, um, getting her right, getting the nuance right. And she came to me in 2013 
And I was watching a documentary called 20 Feet from Stardom. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is a music documentary. It won an Oscar that year. Um, but it's about background singers, most of them Black women who never really got their due. You know, they have made these iconic contributions to music, but nobody knows their names, just their voices. And I love the idea of making a woman like that a star, like through fate and through different machinations, pulling her to center stage, putting her in the spotlight and imagining what that would be like for her in this era of music that I'm sort of obsessed with, the early 1970s, mm. and imagining what she would sacrifice, um, imagining mm. what her struggles would be, as well as her joys and her responsibilities mm. that she would feel, all those things I was thinking about. And, you know, mm. I started thinking about real women in, in music and in rock and roll as sort of like, you know, North stars. And so there were three that were really influential to me. Um, one was Grace Jones was probably like the first one that I was thinking about just because I didn't quite yet know the character. And I was thinking her, of her very physically and thinking of mm. her style and the kind of scene that she's on. So I was thinking about Grace. Then a little bit deeper into it, I started thinking about Nona Hendrix, who's one third mm -hmm. of LaBelle and was really kind of mm -hmm. like the rock and roll spirit of LaBelle and has done some amazing things both with her, um, her bandmates in LaBelle, but also solo as well. Um, and then I was thinking about Betty Davis, who is the funk icon who just passed away not too long ago um, and thinking about her brief moment of fame and sort of her positioning um, in a not very cool way as a muse, which is sort of sort of a concept that I've really struggled with, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of stripping women artists of their own talent and their own brilliance and agency. Um, but thinking about her vocal style was very Betty Davis because Opal doesn't have the most beautiful voice, but she has an X factor, you mm -hmm. know, and she screeches and yelps and kind of more vocalizes than sings. And also Betty Davis had sort of a um, very bold, you know, um, for Betty Davis, it was kind of like an in-your-face sexuality. For Opal, it's more political, but still the two things are very, like, uncompromised always. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that dedication to certain ideals and certain um, perspectives, I think, was very important to the character. So those three were sort of like my, my triumvirate of influences for Opal, as well as all those women that I kind of feel like the book in a way is dedicated to that I feel like could have gone so much farther, mm -hmm. you know, in a different time, maybe, you know, um, those kinds of women that I feel like I wish I had known about them earlier in my developing years. I wish I had known that they existed. Yeah. Because I would have felt less odd as a teenager for what I liked. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love in the book the way that you're able to include what Opal means to fans um, right up until the very end, um, what she means to them. So thank you for sharing that insight. Um, this idea of a muse is really interested, interesting because Opal and Nev have this complicated relationship um, yeah. in the book where Opal isn't quite a muse to Nev, but they have, um, he relies on her heavily for the creative process as she's coming into her own um, as an artist. And I was just so fascinated with how their relationship morphs and my understanding of it morphs from the beginning of the novel to the end. And you get into, um, you know, what's, what's interesting and passionate and endearing about Nev, particularly in his early years. Mm -hmm. And then like the real limits of yeah. his friendship, allyship, trustworthiness and character as the yeah. book goes on, which I thought was um, real, 
and um, and powerful um, and challenging to a particular kind of reader. Um, and I, I was curious about your imagining of their mm -hmm. relationship. Did you always know those dimensions or did it take shape or surprise you as you it, worked on the book? It definitely surprised me and it definitely evolved and took shape. Um, I'm not, I don't know about you. I'm not much of an outline writer. You know, I think that, um, I, you know, there's that analogy about writing, like driving a car and you only like, I'm the kind of, like, I only know as far as right. the headlights go, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, I just creep along and, and all of that. And I think that, you know, I don't know that I'm going to do that again. I think yeah. maybe I'm trying to be a little more outlined next time. But for me, it sort of led to some really interesting moments where I kind of really did shock myself with the characters. And um, the Opal and Nev relationship was one that I wasn't always sure what I wanted it to be, you know? Mm -hmm. Like at one point, I think early on, oh, are they going to be romantic? Maybe, maybe not, you know? Like, is it going to be kind of like an on-again, off-again thing? But I found that I really enjoyed writing about them as friends. I thought that was just so much more um, interesting and in a weird way kind of um, rich for unique kinds of conflicts between, between these two characters. And I loved writing about them as children and kind of seeing the things that they had in common, like both of them being a bit odd, you know, a bit weird in their peer groups, maybe a bit um, teased for different reasons when they're growing up. I also love that, you know, she had spent formative years in Birmingham and he had spent formative years in Birmingham and like thinking about like all those really superficial things. But the main thing that I loved writing about, the thing that I think bonds the two of them and then eventually mm -hmm. tears them apart um, is the fact that they're both hugely ambitious, hugely mm -hmm. ambitious. And the thing that drives them apart, though, is that one of them is willing to do anything for that ambition, and the other one has a limit. Um, and that's the thing that is sort of like wrenching for, for Opal as a character. Um, is sort of struggling with that ambition and what it means to her and what she's going to do to get what she wants, right? And so I thought that that was kind of interesting to explore. Um, and then to kind of see how, you know, um, little jealousies rise up, but not like a romantic jealousy, just mm -hmm. kind of like um, both of them really kind of hungry for love and for an audience's love and the listener's love. And, and feeling envy mm. when the other is more appeal, you know, like all those kinds of things that I thought was interesting to think about in terms of art. Yeah, it was fascinating to see um, all the messiness and dimensions there. I believe that you didn't outline this book because I don't know how you would have. Like it just has so, the, the structure is so complex but the reading experience so seamless. Um, I don't know how you would have outlined it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just so many parts, you know, um, but the way it holds together is remarkable. And, you know, like a question that I always find a little baffling as a writer is like, how did you do that? Cause I, yeah. you know, my answer is like, well, what do you mean? I like imagined it and I wrote it and I did it. But I found myself reading this thinking, how did she do this? Yeah. Like how did she put this together like all oh of the different gosh. voices the ways that yeah. they're distinct and alive because it's not just opal and nav we have people from the label who worked in all kinds of positions we have fans family members friends just the expansiveness of your vision and the clarity was just mind-blowing and so i'm going to mm -hmm. ask you the question that i hate but i want to know which is how did you write this book? Like mm -hmm. nuts and bolts approach, like how did you build it is the first part of my question. Then I have a second part about how you wrote this book. Yeah. If, if, yeah. So um, I have to admit, 
I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> like, I, not, I was deep into writing this novel before I went to grad school. I had never really um, had like a, a literary education um, mm. too much. I'd taken a couple workshops here and there. And so, you know, I will say that the first half was just kind of me having fun, you know? And that first half is kind of intact from the earliest days, just kind of imagining mm. them as children and how they would meet and imagining the different characters who would need to be around them. Like they would have a record producer and they would have like a label head and, you know, all of those things. Naima, the second half of this book nearly killed me. <laughs> it doesn't read that way. It doesn't read that way, but I believe you. Can I tell, I cannot even, count the number of revisions I did to get that second half right. Because, mm -hmm. you know, without giving away any spoilers, one of the things that, you know, we talked about surprising yourself in the writing process, there's a massive secret revelation that is, is revealed at sort of the exact halfway point of the book. And that shocked me when that happened. And I thought, oh, I don't know what happens next. And I remember I had to take, you know, I was in school at the time, I took a full semester off trying to figure it out, but also kind of trying to come to terms with a character breaking my heart, you know, mm. um, and, and figuring out, I've written this thing that feels like that surprising but inevitable moment that we kind of talk about as writers, but now I don't know how to, how to get to the end. I don't know what the end is, you know? And so um, it was a real process of sort of really thinking deeply and understanding not, you know, the, the plot points of the end, but knowing what emotional note, like knowing how mm. I wanted to land the thing emotionally. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I think I probably did with my agent, we did maybe like two major revisions. And then with my editor, um, we did a few more, but it was very much like that second half is completely overhauled. There was like a 50 page section that I ended up cutting, you know, that I um, really loved, but was kind mm. of slow down pulsion, you know, that's when you get into the real craft work and figuring out like, this may be like well written at the sentence level, but it's completely stopping right. the action in its tracks or, you know, it just doesn't fit into this story. So it was making a lot of those decisions. And in terms of the characters and their voices, that was the fun for me. That was the fun part. I mean, I think that um, I've always just loved to listen to people and understand maybe something about character through the way that they speak, you know? And so um, you'll notice that each character has a different signature to the way that they speak. Like mm. Nev um, kind of is like run on sentences, rat-a-tat, you know, kind of like his tongue trying to keep up with his brain. Um, with, you know, Virgil, it's a little peppering of French, you know, in, mm. into the language. Um, with Howie, it's very, you know, profane. Um, Bob Hyes is sort of like a highborn Englishman, even though he's not actually highborn, but he has sort of an elegance. Um, Dignified, to, yeah. Di a dignity, yeah. Um, and then I also thought about the different ways that each character would curse. Like that was a mm. good exercise to get me into each voice and to make them feel differentiated. Um, and I do feel for each of the characters, you know, um, I one of the most fun things to do is just get on the internet and play, watch YouTube mm. clips of different people speaking and kind of like capture that tenor and the syntax of the voice. Um, so all of those things were were helpful. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. I'm gonna ask you the second part of my question, but I noticed that a question just popped up um, that we'll get to later, but I wanna encourage folks who are watching to to drop your questions so that we can get to them later in about 15 minutes or so. So thanks 
um, to those who've already submitted and keep them coming in. Um, so it's interesting to hear about your process in terms of like what it was like logistically, like lots of revision, like going over it, that second half, you know, which which reads which reads like a dream, but sounds like <laughs> it's very difficult to figure out and put together. Um, but sort of beyond process, as a writer, I'm really interested in what equips us to write our books in the ways that only we could, you know? Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. whether that's passions and interests or life experiences or um, reading experiences, whatever it is that is beyond what we learned in graduate school, you know, what came out in the rounds of revision with the Asian and the editor, I'm wondering what you feel in in your life, your interests, however you want to answer it, um, made you able to write this book in the way that only you could. Oh wow, yeah. I mean, I I think that um, so this book took me about eight years to finish. That's from the the very first words I wrote to it being published. Um, mm -hmm. but I've said that I feel like in a way I was writing this book all my life and, um, you know, you mentioned the word passion and I think that's where it comes from is that, um, my family has always been very passionate about arts, but about mm -hmm. music, especially, um, there was always music, always, always, uh, my grandparents loving the music of their youth, you know, jazz vocalists, and then my parents being into Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, that kind of thing from their youth. And then when I was young, the early 90s, it was such a rich time for music. There's so much going on. You know, I had um, a cousin who was very into hip hop. So I was very much into like Native Tongues, De La Soul and Tribe Called Quest and all that. But I also loved indie rock and alternative and Brit pop and post punk and like all of those things that were happening that I was just fascinated by. But it, I didn't, you know, often see women who look like us, like front and center making that, that music. And so mm -hmm. I always felt growing up that um, I felt a little bit like my identity was fragmented in a sense uh, mm. because back then, you know, the music you listened to could be very defining to someone else of like who you were. And so I always mm -hmm. felt uncomfortable in that because mm -hmm. like, if I like this and I don't see people like myself making it, what does that mean about who I am in here? Yeah. yeah. And so like writing this book was really sort of like, my exploration of that and, um, you know, my exploration of, of um, kind of the feeling I had when all those fragments came together and I understood that I could like whatever I liked on that front and still be, you know, a proud black woman, you know? And so um, I, I remember like there are moments along the way that I feel like I was preparing to write this book. Um, in mm -hmm. 2003, the Afropunk documentary came out and I was like, oh my God, like we're out here, we're here, you know? Yeah. And then there was like, um, after I saw that film, I discovered the the message boards, the Afropunk message boards where people were connecting, you know, and building a community. And I just love that idea. And I sort of wish for something like that when I was a teenager. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the, the one piece of writing advice that I give to when, whenever emerging writers say, you know, what's the advice you have? And I think it's that you have to write about things that obsess you and you mm. have to write about things that you're that passionate about because that's what keeps you going back and back and back over the course of eight years or 12 years or however long it takes you to finish it. You always have to have that curiosity and that love for what you're doing. And you can't really care about whatever publishing is doing or whatever you think is hot right now. You know, if those things align, yeah. fine. But if you can express yourself and your passion on the page, then you'll it'll come through and 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 
other people will be interested too. You'll have an audience, you know? And that's why it's so gratifying to hear you, Naima, say that it resonated in that way, yeah. you know? Because of course that's something that you worry about when it's done and it's coming out and you're like, oh, I don't know if there's enough readers for this, but we're here, we're out. Yes, yes. I mean, your book is such a gift. I I had, you know, similar experiences as a young person. I remember going to one of the early Afropunk festivals when it was like a block party in Clinton yes. Hill. Yeah, in the feeling, van parking lot. Yeah. Do you remember those days? Yeah. yeah. And just feeling so thrilled and less alone than in times where I'd go to concerts with my friends. You know, I have a memory of going with a friend to a punk show. Um, and we were talking about like some hip hop that we loved and someone turned around and was like, are you at the wrong concert um, to, to me and my friend among other experiences. So it was just such um, a delight and so meaningful um, to encounter um, these themes and a figure like Opal and all of the black women who love her um, yeah. in your book. So thank you for sharing about that. And I am I am curious about what it has been like for you to see the public life of this book. You know, in your introduction, we heard about um, how celebrated this novel is and rightly so from being a finalist for the Aspen Literary Prize, so long listed for the Women Prize. It was also a book of the month club pick. Obama loves it. <laughs> um, I'm curious what it has meant to you to have the book out in the world and what is a strange season for so many of us, a strange yeah. and difficult season? Um, what has it meant to you and what has the response been from readers? Well, I feel um, so fortunate that this book has found an audience that includes readers that I never would imagine <laughs> would be reading the book. I mean, and, like, I kind of imagine, you know, like Michelle and Barack in bed and Michelle's reading this and she's like, have you read this? And he's like, oh, no, what is that? You know? <laughs> it's, so, yeah. it's just like, um, it's, it's exhilarating. Um, I do think that um, it has been interesting to navigate the difference between being a writer and being an author. And I know that you know this, having been a GMA club pick and being very public and all the responsibilities that tie to that. Um, as exciting as it is, it can sometimes be hard to like turn those switches on and off, you know? And so um, I kind of have been in full author mode for a, for a long time, like almost a year now. And um, and looking forward to getting a little bit of quiet headspace so that I can go back to a new project and start writing again. You know, yeah. I think um, the second, and, and maybe you can give me some advice offline about doing the <laughs> second book, because I think it's something that a lot of debut novelists kind of struggle with, you know, to, to get into that second project. But overall, I mean, you know, of course, when you dream about publishing a book, it doesn't look like a pandemic. It doesn't look mm. like not being able to do events and everything. But it has been so special for me. And I've been so um, grateful for the attention that it's gotten. So grateful for technology that we're able to talk about the book in this format. It's like the Jetsons is happening yeah. right yeah. now. Yeah. That we're doing yeah. like video chats and so I'm I'm grateful for it all grateful for it all yeah well you know no pressure you have to do what's right for you but we need another book we need another book Donnie from you um and from your voice but you do you do you know I know I'm thinking oh, about it yeah. I promise it's yeah. it's burning over in my head no words yeah. are coming yet but I am turning some stuff over, so. Yes, well, I'm I'm eager to read it and whatever it may be. And I'm grateful that we have the final revival of Opal and Nev in the meantime. Um, I'm curious about um, whether there are any practices that you have that help you sustain a creative life. You know, like it's mm -hmm. interesting to be an author who has written about the creative life of other creators. You know, in the book, we have Opal and Nev and their process and the ebbs and flows and Opal's own career and her phases. 
um, and what informs her. We haven't even spoken about fashion in our conversation yeah. tonight, but that's an important part of who Opal is and her friendship yeah. with Virgil and the book. But, you know, it's a book that um, it's about creativity, um, a creative life, an expressive life, um, how Opal in particular um, finds freedom in expression um, and takes that freedom and passes it along. Um, I'm curious if you have anything that you do that helps sustain your creative practice or just helps sustain you, period, including in this time yeah. where you're doing so much as an author. Um, yeah. Um, I've always been a person who's very inspired by real history and by sort of astonishing moments in, in, in culture. Um, so I consume a lot of film, television, documentaries. I look at a lot of photography and sort of find myself, especially with photography, um, kind of dreaming into a picture and trying mm -hmm. to like um, have my own formulation of what I think is going on in the picture and how that contrasts with the reality of it. Um, mm -hmm. I Documentaries, I think are just like, you know, um, I was very happy Summer of Soul won for best documentary yes. last night yeah. um, because like that, that is a film that just made my heart sing. It just like hit on every level for me. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the way that um, uh, Questlove was able to sort of weave together the music and the real history, like those sort of are really inspiring and looking at the artistic choices of different artists is really inspiring reading of course I mean mm -hmm. you know one of the perks of being an author is that you get you know an advanced peek of what's coming out and I'm really yeah. excited about a lot of books that I've read lately um and you know the I I watched like the Velvet doc, the Velvet Underground documentary, you know, and seeing how that was put together. I'm very interested in things that are sort of mosaics or pastiches, mm. you know, that combine mm. different forms. Um, and so that's really inspiring to me as well. And just you know. Um, of course, I consume a lot of journalism as well. From you know, I mean, from my old career, just like going back and reading old interviews with people who fascinate me, or following you know different conversations that are happening, all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I can I can see those influence so influences so much in Final Revival of Opal and Neb. Like even yeah. just your interest in photography and yeah. there's a there's a very important photograph um in this novel um for those who who haven't read it yet and get to look forward to that look out for this photograph that's really yeah. important in the in the life of the the band um and it's interesting that the book serves as a kind of archive for them so it's interesting to hear of your interest in these kinds of archives and archival projects and oh yeah um, do you have a i mean I, I i feel like i'm so greedy with opal and neb i'm like i want a playlist i want a mood <laughs> board i want the reading list and the documentary list like all of these kinds of media that are a part of this book and that went into it is there a playlist did you make the there playlist? is a playlist there is a playlist, there is okay. a playlist. um it is on, well, it's on Spotify, which I know we have different feelings about now, but I made it a year ago. So it's, it's on right. there. Um, and then what's interesting is, so I made that one and it's full of songs um, that I felt like sound like Opal and Nev from that mm. era of time, the early 70s. But it also includes artists that I feel like would have been inspired by them. So oh, that's wonderful. Like, like who? Like Janelle Monet and this band Noisettes out of the UK and um, Arcade Fire, you know, like bands like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So I loved it. I had so much fun putting that together. And of course, it has Betty Davis and Nona Hendrix and a Grace Jones song, all of that. 
But what I was really excited about is that people who read the book were also making their own playlists. So there oh, are several wonderful. different people in their playlists. And there was one person who painstakingly <laughs> put together a playlist of every real artist that's mentioned in the book or every real song that's mentioned in the book. And it's like, I mention a lot of them. So it's a pretty big playlist. Um, so yeah, that was cool. And someone, you know, someone recently said about photography, like, you know, I get the comment a lot that people think that it's real when they first were reading oh, it. Yeah. And she was saying that she sort of, you know, how in the middle of the book of a, of a true story, you'll get like that little section of photos. <laughs> yeah. She was like, yeah. where are the photos? <laughs> Where's this photo? <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, that would be cool to kind of do like, an art, cool. like a fine art project to like yeah. stage those or something. That would be fun. Yeah. Well, that is amazing about the playlist that someone created with that level of detail. I mean, oh, yeah. I think I think that that kind of passion, sadly, um, is something that we rarely connect to or publicly demonstrate in our adult lives. Um, yeah. But it's so much a marker of, of youth. Oh um, my gosh. Like, you know, like, tapes, you remember yeah, making Yeah, I and, do, oh, I do. There was and, a real art to it, I miss it, yeah. Yeah, and I think it speaks to the level of investment that person had in your book and how alive it was. Know, that's I amazing. It. It that's so an amazing. Cool. Yeah. yeah, that's really yeah. beautiful. Um, and we've got a link in the chat to that playlist for all who want to listen. I'm going to listen. I can't believe I missed it. Um, and <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Donnie, for chatting with me. Um, thank you. Yeah, this is my yeah. pleasure. Um, <laughs> And I think we've got questions. We've got questions from folks in the audience. Yay. Love questions. I think that you're you're yeah. you're start we're you're muted, but um, I was saying yeah. that one of them is from me because oh. I have to do something. Uh, <laughs> but I, I won't play favorites. Oh, that is my phone. Um, okay. This is from Emily McCann. I know this is a cheesy question, but do you have a dream cast for any of the characters, especially oh. Oval? That is not a, <laughs> a great question. So yeah, so um, I don't have, I mean, I anybody, like there's so many talented people, I don't wanna say, but I will say that um, I have had a couple people on Instagram I love people on Instagram, <laughs> like put together kind of like a mood, a cast mood board. And um, I think, who did they put as Opal? I mean, I've seen Michaela Cole, who I think would be kind of amazing as yeah. Opal. I've yeah. seen Janelle Monet. I've seen Lupita Nyong'o. All those suggestions as Opal are, are very interesting. Mm -hmm. But what's, you know, um, it, it would be cool to think about if there's a young version and an older version, you know what I mean? Mm. So yeah, that could be, that could be cool to think about. Yeah. 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 Naima, do you have any, like, did you picture anyone in your head in particular? I didn't. I mean, I think that they, they were, you know, in the way that when I often read, it's just like, they are the, the image and the physicality that the author has conjured for us. So I wasn't, yeah. you know, I didn't cast, um, you know, like one of the Weasley brothers as Nev. <laughs> 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 you know, like they just were as they, you know, yeah. Donnie described them, you know, yeah. like in some ways, it's really fun to think about the casting. Um, uh, it's very exciting, but then there's also, you know, we get the the added bonus of who they are and can only be in the text, you know, yeah. like part of what yeah. Donnie has created and then how that comes to life in each reader, which is so special. Yeah, I think that's really magical, which is why I'm always like, you know, should I be so lucky that this gets adapted? Like I, um, like there's always kind of like, I, I'm sort of like, I, I don't want to talk too much about that because I don't want to break that magic for whoever people are seeing until until it's time, you know. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I have heard from Nev, I've heard the Weasley brothers, like one of those, I've heard Ed Sheeran. I, <laughs> I would like to put forward someone who is 
too old now, I think, but like specifically young Pam Greer um, okay. from like the Jackie Brown movies. Yeah. That is what I pictured. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody even did um, uh, like sort of counter casting and they did Janelle Monet as Pearl, which I thought was really oh, fascinating. Really like, really so Pearl really. is Opal's half sister. She's very churchy and mm -hmm. very like Pearl blessing. Janelle Monet in anything is fine with me. <laughs> yeah, I actually funny. like that. I think that that's, that, I think that's yeah, fun, right? Like it's different. That. Yeah, cool. yeah. Yeah. Especially because Pearl. Is it a different kind of artist than Opal? Right. Yeah. yeah. That's really okay. Well, that was that was a fun question. That was not cheesy, Emily. No, uh, no, that's great. All right. Timbo says, uh, "What are you reading?" Um, assuming I'm assuming right now. Yeah. And I uh, can answer this too if you want. Can I? I'm, I want to add, Donnie. You mentioned some books you're excited about too that are coming out. I'd love yeah. to know what you're looking forward to too. Yeah. So um, there are two books that I've read recently. Um, one is called Sirens and Muses by Antonia Angris, and it's a novel um, about art school, and it's kind of about mm. ambition in the visual arts, um, and it's about. Uh, you know, the ethics of art and commercialism and um, the ethics of things that we use as material and inspiration. Um, mm. I think that comes out in July. It's a really, really good, um, funny, but also serious uh, novel that has some satirical elements. I love, love, loved it. The characters, it follows three and they're all really interesting and surprising in different ways. So I, I really love that one. Um, the other one is called All This Could Be Different by Sarah Tankham Matthews. Um, and that is a book about friendship. It is such a pure and beautiful book. Um, mm. Completely uncynical, but about a group of friends who truly love each other and are trying to make a better world, really. Um, they have kind of have this dream of communal living. Mm -hmm. And um, I just felt, you know, the, the primary character, her name is Sneha, and she's just so dear. And you worry about her, you know, you worry about her working this job that doesn't pay her enough. And you worry about her living situation. It's a very emotional book. I think that comes out in August. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two that I've read recently that I that I really love. And I just started a new, you know, these are all books that are coming out. I just started a new one called Dances by, I think the writer's name is Nicole Cuffey. Um, it is about a, uh, a ballerina, a young Black woman who becomes principal dancer of the New York City Ballet and sort of about that world and what and what she experiences in that world. Yeah. That sounds really very good, good so far. Yeah. Oh, those sound great. Yeah. What are you reading, Naima? What am I reading? Um, I I'm reading um I'm reading the forthcoming memoir from Ingrid Rojas Contreras, The yeah. Man Who Can Move Clouds. Ooh. Um, which I'm really enjoying. Um which is about her grandfather, who was a curandero in Colombia, and sort of like that tradition in her family, in her mother and in her. Um, it's great. It's a it's a memoir. It's a family memoir and story. Um, oh, I'm enjoying that. that. Yeah. I, um, Clavis writes about curan, curanderas, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. and then and Clavis's book is one that I'm excited. Clavis Nathera has a forthcoming novel in May um, called Neruda on the Park. So um, good. Yeah. I read it too. So yeah. Good. Yeah. I loved it um, about a mother and a daughter and their different responses um, and the different ways they're implicated in the gentrification of their neighborhood um, as this new development is going up. I just, I love that book, although I read it some time ago now. Um, I'm reading a couple different things. So I just yeah. finished Open Aren't by Rachel all? Krantz. Yeah. Oh, I've been wanting to read that. How it's is really it? It's really good. It's okay. really good. I finished it. So it's about um, polyamory um, and also just intimacy, um, self-knowledge, 
um, love, sex, power, consent. He's really, really good. I'll check it out. Yeah. All right. And for the last question, this one's for me. Um, I have a little spiel before it. Um, there is a, a, I guess, a column or like a section in the cut um, called I Think About This A Lot. <laughs> and I love it so much um, because I also get like these moments from things just stuck in my head on loop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you have like a favorite pop culture moment or just any like fashion or art moment that like just lives in your head? Mm. <laughs> mm, that's a great question. I think mine if you need time to think, but <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one of them is Janet and Justin at the Super Bowl. <laughs> Solemn nodding in agreement. <laughs> yeah, I think about that a lot and um, the fallout of that and how it lay on each of them very differently. And, you know, um, I think about things where we have one reaction to them in the moment, and then years later, we look at them quite differently. Mm -hmm. Yes, especially like a redemption. I'm noticing like a mass redemption of like maligned women. Yes. In the 90s and 2000s. Yes. Yes. And then I think a lot about, um, oh God, one thing I think about a lot, a lot, a lot, because I'm trying to understand um, or trying to wrap my head around um, Camille Cosby. Um, and what she is thinking, honestly, you know, um, I watched with a lot of interest that um, documentary that was on Showtime that was like, we need to talk about Cosby. It. And it was yeah. Yeah. But I sort of, I, I think a lot about um, the spouses and wives of these kinds of men. It's something I'm kind of turning around a lot in my head. Uh, and and how they make their choices yeah that's a great question i want to know what naima says <laughs> oh know? i don't you know i i don't have a good um a good sense i i mean i have like a i have a toddler so some of my like <laughs> my culture like references are like i think a lot about like charlie brown or like <laughs> because um, we, we watched Charlie Brown. Um, but um, I love this as a craft exercise too, like uncovering your own passions and obsessions, as you said, Donnie, as a writer, but also even like thinking about characters and what are the things that that they obsess over or yeah. the things that they're struggling to yeah. understand and to yeah. figure out, you know, like those um, those questions. So. I don't have I don't have a good one myself, but um, yeah, I'm definitely interested in us reconsidering our narratives about women, like our yes. like our patriarchal sexist narratives yes. from the recent past. Yeah, um, you know, because we're not reconsidering our you know sexist takes at the moment, <laughs> but like, but like the recent past, um, Justin Timberlake implicated in a in a couple of them. Uh, yeah. so right. Um, Whew. Yeah. yeah, so that's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and encouraging to see kind of like some, at least some publics, like narratives right. um, and imagination shifting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely fascinated by like the redemption of hyper feminine and hypersexual women. Um, Cause I think we're mm -hmm. just starting to grapple with the fact that that's not inherently evil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that's a really fun question. I, well, that's not to come up with my own question, but I think you're right. <laughs> it's a really fun craft thing. Um, yeah, I love and, that. Yeah, I like that yeah. too. I might use that. <laughs> you should. You're you should. <laughs> Who 
Who needs an outfit? <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, but thank you so much for spending time with us. It really means the world. And thank you everyone for coming out and hanging out. Don't forget to get your signed copy if you haven't pre-ordered one already. Yay. And uh, you can find us at Astoria Bookshop on pretty much everything or at our website, astoriabookshop.com. Um, okay. <laughs> Have a good night, okay. everyone. Y'all make sure you pick up what's mine and yours. Also a paperback with a gorgeous new cover. Oh, thank you, Donnie. Thank you all so much. Good night.